Postface, Defining Neoliberalism, is a chapter, the final chapter of the book, The Road from Mont Pelerin, The Making of the Neoliberal Thought Collective. It's written by one of the editors of the book, Philip Morawski. The chapter is really an attempt to describe, define and analyse neoliberal thought as expressed by the members of the Mont Pelerin Society, who are thought to be the originators of neoliberal thought. So Murawski says that neoliberalism is, is not particularly a political or economic commitment, but an epistemic commitment. It's an idea, neoliberalism is a commitment to an idea about knowledge, a specific vision of the role of knowledge in human affairs, which is how you can arrive at a reasonably coherent and effective set of doctrines. And the idea is through a marketplace of ideas, that through ideas being tested on the market, we arrive at a much better set of ideas than any individual can come up with him or herself. And he points out that the people who attended Mont Pelerin, the members of the Mont Pelerin Society, had a lot of disagreements. But he argues there are some fundamental principles which emerge. Now, in order to explain what these fundamental uh, principles are, he digresses to make an analysis of an entry in Wikipedia written around about 2005, and that specific entry is the entry on neoliberalism. So the Wikipedia entry on neoliberalism. And as you may know, on Wikipedia, various authors argue and debate, and then finally, ideally, agree on whatever, the, how to define any term such as, um, I don't know, tea, glass, glasses, chin. Wikipedia would thus seem to be the perfect way to arrive at truth in a neoliberal fashion. That is, in a marketplace, the Wikipedia website, different ideas from different people compete and the best ones should emerge. And they, therefore, Wikipedia should become the best encyclopedia because of this competing ideas in a sort of fair marketplace. Murawski, who's a critic of neoliberalism, thinks this doesn't happen on Wikipedia. And to point out it doesn't happen on Wikipedia, he actually goes straight to the definition of neoliberalism, neoliberalism on Wikipedia. So it's a kind of funny, interesting, and at times arrogant turn. He records what the different authors said about neoliberalism, the term neoliberalism. One author said it's overused and it's a confusing term. Another asked, do people identify as neoliberal? Another author said it's the same as libertarianism. Murawski then says, well, it's not just lay people who are contributing to Wikipedia who are confused, but also scholars are confused as well. No, nobody can seem to agree on a definition of what exactly neoliberalism is. What Murawski points out is that Wikipedia, which should be this neoliberal paradise, it should be something that proves if you're a neoliberalism, it should prove your theory is correct because it is a marketplace of ideas. But it's not at all like that. He says that it's hierarchical. He also states that um, good articles decay. They get subjected to um, vicious infighting. Wikipedia was based on Hayek's idea that individual knowledge, an individual knowledge like you or me, uh, is wonky. But aggregating it, if you have an aggregating mechanism, then you can fix it. Quotes, knowledge in this schema in Hayek schema, is frequently treated as though it was a disembodied thing, and consequently human progress comes from the accumulation of information at various technological sites, as Wierowski points out, even Wikipedia itself cannot define neoliberalism. If it's so bad, then Wierowski says, why has it succeeded? Why is it still around now? Because he says it suckers people into providing information for free. And the only way they can get their information accepted is by, by um, citing uh, accepted sources, which means that they extract other, extract other people's intellectual property for free. They go and read the New York Times, and use the New York Times as their source for the Wikipedia article. They therefore steal off the New York Times, and Wikipedia uses their free labor and their stealing to make uh, a journal article. And this kills off newspapers and encyclopedias like Encyclopedia Britannica, which in fact Wikipedia is based on. Moreover, we're asking you doesn't stop here, Google is symbi symbiotically related to Wikipedia so that 
Google search results always promote Wikipedia. And this is exactly the problem with the neoliberal commitment to knowledge as emerging from the marketplace, according to Wierowski. Neoliberalism masquerades as popular knowledge over elite pretensions, but what should be a libertarian organisation, Wikipedia, ends up becoming a totalitarian hierarchy. Okay, so the point Mirowski makes is this. Neoliberals believe that a marketplace is the best way to develop thought and knowledge. However, if you look at Wikipedia and its failings, you can see why the neoliberals have got it wrong. He now tries to define the characteristics of neoliberalism. He, said it, he says it's, quotes, the most important movement in political and economic thought in the second half of the 20th century. The attendees of the Mont Pelerin Society and other neoliberals have, have found it very difficult to agree on the, on the principles of neoliberalism. He says the best way to approach it is as a thought collective that is a long-term, intricately structured philosophical and political project and not as a simple conspiracy. He makes a good point that neoliberalism is, is poorly understood and he says, quotes, it draws some of its prodigious strength from that obscurity, end quotes. Mirowski in, insists that neoliberalism cannot be simply defined. It was developed by scholars and think tanks and it's more a thought collective. And he quotes Fleck here. It is as if we want to, to record in writing the natural course of an excited conversation among several persons, all speaking simultaneously among themselves, each clamoring to make himself heard. So the idea is that amongst all these differing voices, a consensus does emerge. And it is a so it what has emerged is a social phenomenon with a similar theoretical orientation. And if we look at the Mont Pelerin Society and related actors, we can better understand that theoretical orientation. Okay, so those thinkers themselves, um, they, they date, he says, back to the 30s and 40s. And there were people who tended to be excluded or on the margins of universities. They'd been picked, handpicked initially by Hayek to join the Mont Pelerin Society and then eventually um, the Mont Pelerin Society um, chose members themselves. Up to the 1980s, neoliberalism, neoliberals came to dominate specific departments, economics departments, that is, the University of Chicago, the London School of Economics, etc. Also, neoliberalism developed through ostensibly philanthropic and charitable organisations, Mirowski points out. These think tanks emerged to provide um, timely pieces, opinion pieces to newspapers, talking heads for um, news interviews on TV, and even single issue organisations. Now, the anchor for all of this uh, different activity was the three foes of neoliberalism. The first foe is laissez-faire classical liberalism and I think what he's referring there to there is Adam Smith's classical liberalism where the state was merely a night, a night watchman. Um, the state had a small role and um, the market would be guided by the so-called invisible hand. Social welfare liberalism, which is uh, the used to be the countries of Scandinavia were famous for, is the other enemy, and the third enemy is socialism. So neoliberalism sees itself as set against those three enemies: laissez-faire classical liberalism, social welfare liberalism, and socialism. So the efforts of these neoliberal intellectuals were directed towards the elites especially elite civil society. Quotes, their efforts were aimed at primarily at winning over intellectuals and opinion leaders of future generations, and their primary tool was redefining the place of knowledge in society. 
So once again, we get back to Murawski's idea that neoliberalism is essentially a theory about knowledge, that knowledge, the best knowledge emerges from a market. The, their goal was to influence politicians and other future leaders and keeping vested interests in mind and winning them over slowly. Mirowski now expands a bit more on this idea about the marketplace as a way of uh, achieving knowledge. Mirowski is saying that even though these neoliberals said the marketplace was the best way to develop thought and ideas, the neoliberals themselves didn't apply that idea in practice because they formed a small group who tried to influence an elite um, in order to, to develop their thought. Mirowski gets to the nub that finally comes down to the definition. He says scholars have been too quick to write off neoliberalism as merely an epiphenomenon of economic. As he's been saying, it's not merely an economic phenomenon, but really at the basic level, it's a commitment to an idea about knowledge, that knowledge is created through a marketplace. Point number one is that according to neoliberalism, a good society has to be constructed. It requires intervention from the state. Now this is a new, uh, this is a departure from classical liberalism which saw the state as the night watchman. The state would um, only interfere where necessary. The market through its invisible hand would just take care of things. The second point is the market is the most effective way to process information and come up with the, cor the correct idea or the new idea or the correct understanding of the world. The third point is that the market is society in its natural state. Um, this is a theory I'm kind of familiar with from elementary school where they introduced economy, they talk about people, uh, I have fish, somebody else has chips, we swap fish for chips and we make transactions, then we develop a currency and that's a natural way for humans to interact. So point three is the market is the natural state. Point four is that the state must be redefined but not destroyed. Quote, neoliberals seek to restructure the state with numerous audit vices under the sign of accountability. Neoli quotes, neoliberals seek to restructure the state with numerous audit devices under the sign of accountability, or better yet, convert state services to be provided on a contractual basis. So it's, it's a way of refining the state, and that's something that we've probably all experienced. Um, audit cultures, if you're working in most bureaucracies, and you're also familiar with contractual basis work. Point five is also, also relates to the state, and that is that the state must be the spearhead of neoliberal reform. Quotes, the neoliberal movement must seek to, consol to consolidate political power by operating from within the state. And what the state does is marketize everything. For example, you look at schools. The idea is that schools uh, will, will work better if the government doesn't support them and they are privatized. And by privatizing, I mean they're put to the market. Okay, point six is that the neoliberal idea of freedom is self-governing individuals improving their life by engaging in the market. And this recalls Zizek's famous um, quote, which I'm going to paraphrase, which was something like, neoliberalism means that everybody is free as long as they go shopping, something to that extent. I'm sure I've got it wrong. But the point is that um, the freedom is understood as an engagement in the market. The idea is of, quote, autonomous self-governed individuals all coming naturally equipped with a neoclassical version of rationality and motives of ineffable self-interest, striving to improve their lot in life by engaging in market exchange. And now Mirovsky moves to a point that is quite new to me. He, point, he argues that for neoliberalism, freedom shouldn't be extended to a freedom to critique the, neoliberalism, the neoliberal system itself. 
um, the knowledge and freedom you accrue should only be towards furthering neoliberalism, not um, critiquing it. That's all very new to me. And I wonder if neoliberalists would have some uh, response to that, but that's not my point here. Merely to, my point is merely to summarise Mirovsky. Point seven for neoliberals, capital must flow freely internationally. And this is to be achieved by reintroducing, quotes, pure market discipline through flexible exchange rates, dismantling capital cont controls, but over the long term, through the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, and the IMF. And these organizations are there to impose neoliberal policies on recalcitrant nation states. Point eight, Hanovsky thinks that neoliberals believe that inequality is necessary. For neoliberals, inequality is necessary because people need something to aspire to. If there are very super rich, super successful people, they will provide a model for us. The next point is, again, quite, um, uh, quite controversial. According to Mirovsky, for neoliberals, quotes, corporations can do no wrong, or at least they are not to blame, not to be blamed if they do. So the idea is set companies free. Doesn't matter if you give huge incentives to CEOs. Um, I suppose the market will sort it all out. Which brings us to point 10. All human problems can be solved by the market and other problems, I guess. Even problems created by the market. So this is why, for example, you have carbon trading in Australia that um, applying market principles to pollution can help reduce pollution. All quotes, again, all human knowledge can only be used to its fullest if it is comprehensively owned and priced. So again, he gets back to his idea of knowledge as produced by the market. And we're at point 10. The neoliberals have struggled from the outset to make their political economic theories do dual service as a moral code. And so individual freedom was the prime virtues. And this, for, he says, has been a struggle to reconcile with religious values. Um, for example, the morality of the Bible doesn't necessarily fit in too well with this notion of pursuing individual freedom. Now, Mirovsky points to some of the internal contradictions with neoliberalism. Now, one thing that neoliberals are clear on is they don't view the state as merely the night watchman, that the state rather should have a much stronger role in society. The government should intervene constantly, according to neoliberals, to keep the market running smoothly. However, some neoliberals were uncomfortable with the size of the state, and it ended up being a division within the Montpelerin society itself between those who supported a larger state, such as Hayek, the father of neoliberalism, and against him were rallied Chicago school thinkers, particularly Friedman, who in the American tradition were skeptical of a large state and sought for a smaller state. I mean, they both agreed that the state should be actively involved, but neither side or, or person could agree on just how big that state would be. It seems, though, that the Chicago faction or the Chicago school has prevailed and the general idea is for a smaller state which is actively involved in managing the market. Another contradiction he talks about is the inability for neoliberals to reconcile utilitarian and libertarian thought in their own writings. So utilitarianism is principle for morality that are uh, providing the greatest good for the greatest number. So sometimes neoliberals will say the neoliberalism is an effective and good way to live our lives because it provides the greatest good for the greatest number. At other times, neoliberals revert to another moral code, which is not utilitarianism, but is rather libertarianism. And in libertarianism, the principle is on individual freedoms. 
Um, so the argument goes, neoliberalism is the best way to achieve individual freedoms. So there's two contrasting approaches. On one approach, it's good because it provides the greatest happiness for the greatest number. On the other side, it's good because it um, protects and furthers individual interests. So if you can see that the two ideas don't meld together well and neoliberal philosophers haven't really managed to, according to Mirovsky, haven't managed to uh, reconcile those two ideas. Um, now a fascinating digression, Mirovsky talks about the importance of a guy named Schmidt, who Mirovsky talks about as Adolf Hitler's crown jurist. In fact, that's what, that's what Hayek refers to him as. And Mirovsky seems to agree that Schmidt is pretty much um, a handmaiden for the Nazis. In particular, Mirovsky feels, the author of this chapter feels, that Hayek's support for a strong state and authoritarian state is similar to that of Schmidt who was used by the Nazis and Adolf Hitler to support the idea of a strong state. Hayek felt, according to Mirovsky, citizens must learn to forget about their rights and instead be given the opportunity to express themselves through the greatest information conveyance device known to humankind, the market. So rights were supposed to be something you forget about, you leave aside and just focus on the market. So this is their authoritarian bent. Quoting Mirovsky again, for Hayek and the neoliberals, the Führer, Adolf Hitler, was replaced by the figure of the entrepreneur, the embodiment of the will to power for the community who must be permitted to act without being brought to rational account. So while Hayek may have thought he was defending liberalism from people like Schmidt, in fact, he ends up having more in common with Schmidt than he would like to admit. Hayek finds himself supporting a strong state and also this kind of will to power ubermensch was not the Führer in this case, but an entrepreneur. Well, put it another way, Mirovsky portrays Hayek as a hypocrite. Um, he himself felt he had the ability to define truth by himself or with a small elite, the Montpellier and society. Yet their own definition of how to define truth was through the, uh, through the marketplace of ideas, that is everybody getting involved and exchanging their thoughts and ideas in a society. And instead, with the Montpellier and society in Hayek, you have a small elite who are, in fact, trying to impose their ideas on society. Now, there's a very unfortunate case where a leftist um, president um, in Chile, Allende, was ousted in a coup and replaced with a right-wing dictator. And neoliberals were thought to have been behind that. It's something that um, Milton Friedman, the Chicago School neoliberal, spends, quote, a good chunk of his autobiography attempting to excuse and explain, end quote. Neoliberals were uh, apparently behind this coup to install Pinochet. And what makes Mirovsky so furious, I believe, because the, the tone of the writing is quite, quite assertive here, is... The neoliberals had arrogated sovereignty to themselves. They thought it was better to have an authoritarian liberalism, by which I mean authoritarian, which is an elite ruling society to ensure liberal values are maintained, than to have a totalitarian democracy, by which I mean a democracy where people vote in a leader who will take away their rights, which is something, and I'm recording this in 2018, we're seeing in many parts of the world right now. Okay, so I think that's it for this um, chapter. The take is that you understand neoliberalism as an epistemic commitment. 
that neoliberalism at base is a theory of truth or, or how to know the truth. Uh, it's an epistemological theory at its very base. It's not an economic, political or whatever theory. Um, now that's quite useful and because it's different to the approaches you might find elsewhere. I think that's really new and exciting for me.